This message entitled, We Should Have Known, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on May 7th, 2017 by the Rev. Roy D. Warren Jr. The scripture reference is Luke 24, 36-45. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Chapter 24, it's verses 36 through 45. Um, Joel, could you go ahead and share this with us? Go ahead and come on up here to the lectern. And uh, it's, it's Luke 24, 36 to 45. I'll describe something while Joel's uh, coming up here on this. Um, in Luke 24, you'll remember that we... Uh, of course, the you know the Easter story is in the first part of the chapter. Then there's the two on the road to Emmaus after that. And then there was the two coming back from Emmaus. And they gathered with the others. And I specifically made mention of all 11 of them being gathered. And then the next story and uh, makes it clear that evidently Thomas had, had left. And so I drew into that last week the, the story from the following week. Normally you would talk about Easter Sunday first and then you would talk about the next Sunday. But I purposely draw, drew in the story of Thomas being there the following week. I drew it into last week's message because it was specifically mentioning that he had been there but he left. And so I just was trying to put the stories together that involved Thomas. So now in this time I want to back up to Easter Sunday, even though we talked about the Sunday after Easter last week, we're going to back up now into um, uh, Easter evening when Jesus appears to the ten disciples and the others that were gathered as well. But remember now, Thomas was not there for this. And this is the text that Joel has before us. It's verses 36 through 45. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, He showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Praise the Lord. Father, we just desire above all things, dear God, that your name be before us, within us, around us, over us, under us, within us. Touch us, dear God, with this truth. I thank you, Lord, that you were so merciful that you came the following week as well and dealt with Thomas in particular. But Lord, on this Easter Sunday night, dear God, Thomas is not there. And so you've got the other ten, plus the other people that were gathered in the room to deal with. And we want to thank you, dear God, that you cared enough, Lord, to do that as well. Praise God. We just exalt you and lift you up, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I suppose through the centuries that every generation has wanted the Lord to come back soon. I don't mean everybody. 
because there's a lot of people that don't even believe in him and many people that don't want to come back soon. They want to go ahead and live their lives. Maybe they think it would be nice to have them back someday and to go to heaven someday. You know, the old joke about, you know, well, I thought you were getting up a busload today, you know, about going to heaven. And uh, they said they didn't want to go to heaven. You don't want to go to heaven? Oh, I thought you were getting up a busload today to go to heaven. Well, see, that's part of the point. Because if you truly do love Jesus and you truly do want to be with Him, why wouldn't it be today? Amen? I mean, we all have our... And I've heard them all, by the way. I've heard them all, you know. Well, I've got my kids. I've got my grandkids. I've got my great-grandkids. i got... You know, and I want to see them grow up. I don't want to see them get married. And all these kind of things. And these are, you know, normal desires. But Jesus is bigger than all of that, is He not? Amen? Amen? Praise God. And listen, if, if all of the people that are around us come to know the Lord, we'll be together. Amen? Talk about a glad heavenly reunion. Amen? Glory be to God. I think every generation has probably wanted the Lord to come back soon. One of our earliest Judeo-Christian documents uh, is called the uh, Didache. And it says, in part, it says, Let not your lamps be quenched. In other words, let not your lights go out. Don't let your lamps be quenched, not your loins unloosed, but be ready. For you know not the hour in which our Lord will come. Now that's all fine that it's in that, like I say, that Jewish Christian very earliest of documents. But hey, this goes back a ways too. Amen? And it says the same thing. Amen? Praise God. Paul said in 2 Timothy, In the future there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved His appearing. All those who have wanted Him to come back soon. All of those that are watching for Him, waiting for Him, looking for Him, wanting Him. Amen? That's what was going on in front of the inn in Emmaus when Jesus pretended to go on and to walk over the next hill. I believe one of them grabbed him by the shoulders and said, No, you've got to stay with us. We, we, want, we want to talk to you some more. And they did, praise God. And they finally recognized who he was and whoosh, back to Jerusalem they go. Why? I believe it was... But because there had to be an expectation that somewhere along the way they were going to actually be able to sit down and talk with him again. Amen? Because they started to, but as soon as he broke the bread and they recognized him, then, you know, he was gone and boy, they were gone too. Gone back. Praise the Lord. I, I can well imagine those two look back on that journey that they made to Emmaus and, and probably said to themselves, we should have known. We should have known. And that's what Jesus was making it clear to them. You know, you should have known. Yes, you're being foolish. Yes, you're being slow of heart. You should have known. It's been in the prophets. It's been in the scriptures. It's, you know, I, I, I said these things while I was still with you and so forth. You know, yes, you should have known. St. Cyril wrote in the 4th century, let us wait and ask, or look rather, for the Lord's coming upon the clouds from heaven. It's very possible that there, were, there have been many throughout all the generations that have come and gone that people have been watching, waiting, looking for His coming. Amen? Augustine, Expected the Lord to return around A.D. 1000. You know, now God never picked a time like that, but He did say, you better think it's coming right now. You better think it's coming in the next five minutes. You, be, you better know it's imminent. You better know it's right, right around the corner. 
The Bible said that too. Not just these church fathers. Amen? The Bible said this was the case. Praise God. And, and praise God for people along the way who have agreed with that. In the 1300s, John Wycliffe concluded that the end of the world and the second coming of Christ should be expected immediately. This book says that too, by the way. He didn't come up with that. Amen? This book says that. Praise God. And just be thankful for the people that agreed with the book. John Calvin advised, hunger after Christ until the dawning of that great day when our Lord will fully manifest the glory of His kingdom. In the 8th century, John Wesley said, the spirit in the heart of the true believer says with earnest desire, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. In the 20th century, evangelist Billy Graham once said, many times when I go to bed at night, I think to myself that before I awaken, Christ may come. That really kind of convicted me when I first read that because I thought, that's not a bad thing to go to sleep with. Amen? When He comes... He'll have a special reward, the Bible says, for all who have longed for His appearing. It's called the crown of righteousness. And we need to train ourselves to think of our Lord's return whenever we see a sunrise, whenever we see a sunset, whenever we see sun, rain, whenever we see snow, whenever we see um, uh, warm weather, cold weather, whenever we see this or that, anything. In other words, all the time, you're supposed to be thinking of Jesus coming back. Amen? Praise God. Every time clouds and sun emer merge together in a spectacular form, you know what I'm talking about, with the huge, amazing, lit up even cloud formations. We saw some just the other day, uh, towards the end of the day. And, you know, I mean, big things, you know? I mean, big clouds, just huge and multicolored and so forth as the sun is uh, on its way to be setting. And, and, and that needs to remind us, whenever you see the clouds and the sun and the, and, and the sky and all of that, just think about, yeah, when He comes back, that's how He's coming. He's coming in the sky. Praise the Lord. You know, I remember there was a fellow at our last church, he said, what do you think about this... Um, the story that's out now about uh, Jesus is actually living on a mountaintop in India and he says he's coming down someday, someday soon and uh, see if anybody believes that, that he is who he says he is. And I said, I, 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 I'm not going to tell you who it was that said so, but um, I've told the story before so maybe you've heard it before, but I told him, I said, it isn't going to happen that way. It's not gonna, he's not going to come down from a mountain. He's coming down from heaven. Amen? In fact, he's coming to the mountain. He's coming to the Mount of Olives. That's what the Bible says. Amen? So you see how strange and weird and wrong stories can get started? And then people go, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? <laughs> not much. Amen? Because it's not in here. <laughs> Glory be to God. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. You know, in the, in the days of the resurrection, I'm talking like 2,000 years ago, the disciples should have known that Jesus would come to see them. They should have known. Were they really expecting Jesus to show up in that upper room on Easter Sunday night? I mean, is that why they were all gathered there? The Bible actually says they were gathered there because they were scared stiff. They thought the religious leaders might be looking for them. I mean, after all, they made quite a career out of trying to get rid of Jesus and, and, and see him dead, and finally they did it. And yeah, there's this stories of resurrection and people even claiming to have seen Jesus, but, you know, were they really gathered to meet Jesus? Don't you think they should have known that Jesus, that soon Jesus would come? I'll put it that way. Soon Jesus would come? Shouldn't we know that today? That soon Jesus is coming? Amen? I mean, were they really waiting for Jesus to show up? No, the Bible says they were scared. 
They were hiding out. They had the doors locked and the windows closed. Doesn't sound very inviting. Doesn't sound like they're waiting for Jesus to come in. Well, praise God he did. Amen? Praise God he did. They should have known. With all of the frenzy of the, of the last few days, I mean, think about it. Jesus' arrest, his trial, his beatings, his execution at Calvary, and, 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 and his burial, I mean, that's, that settles it right there. You know, he lived, he died, he's gone. He's buried. Once someone's buried, that kind of closes things. Except, of course, for our memories. But you know what? I think maybe one of the biggest stressors, that's a, that's a word they use a lot today, you know, of the things that stress you, they're called stressors. I wonder if they called, it, called them that 50 years ago. I don't know. I think it's kind of a new idea. Things that stress you are stressors. That's okay. I mean, they are. I think maybe one of the biggest stressors was word of a resurrection. Because what does that mean? To these ten disciples, and later to the eleventh one, and later when Matthias replaces Judas, to the twelfth one. What about to Paul? And what about to the others? There's a lot of people that don't want to hear about resurrection. There's a lot of people today don't want to hear about somebody that was raised from the dead and now lives forever making uh, intercession for, for us up in heaven. At the right hand of God, Jesus is sitting with God up in heaven, praise God. It's the Holy Spirit that's down, in, down on this earth and within His people, praise God. Isn't that a stressor for a lot of people? I mean, even for people that, that love Jesus and like Jesus, you know, they, had kind of, they, they saw Him arrested. They saw Him uh, uh, hurt and tortured. They saw Him crucified. They saw Him taken down from the cross. They saw Him dead. They saw Him buried. It was over. And now there's talk of resurrection. And more than that, some are claiming to even have seen Him. Including some of them gathered. Some of them are shaking in their sandals. They don't know what it's going to mean. What does this mean for us? Listen, these religious leaders, they hated Jesus with a passion. They got rid of Him. They were probably glad to get rid of Him. And now He's back? I mean, what does that say about what they're going to want to do to us? Do you hear me? Do you see what I'm saying? What's it going to mean I mean, after all, they had been through. What was it going to mean for them that this Jesus is raised from the dead? And what is it going to mean for us? Because it's not just a matter of believing that He was. It's a matter of believing that He is. Amen? And because He is, so are we. Raised from the dead. Amen? I'm not talking about at the end of life. I'm talking about at the end of the self-life. Raised from the dead. Praise God. And besides all of that, by Easter Sunday night, some of them had actually seen Him. For those that hadn't seen Him, that could be a hard one to get a handle on. Do you understand what I'm saying? They know he's dead. They know he's gone. Then they heard stories of angels saying that he's alive. And then, lo and behold, some people actually say they saw him. Mary and the women say they saw him. Peter, sitting right there in the room, says, I saw him. Are these people to be believed? Or are they just so wanting Jesus to be alive that... They're thinking he is. And not only that, but these two just came in from being at Emmaus. They come running in and, and, and we told them what we know and we, they, told them, they told us what, what they know. Thomas sneaks out the door and all of a sudden, poof, Jesus shows up.
They should have known. Really. I'm not trying to be condemning. I'm just simply saying they should have known. They should have known that he was alive. Why? Because other people saw him? No. But because he said he would be. He even told him three days later, I'm alive. Look at your watches, guys. Three days have passed. They should have believed it because Jesus said so. Should have known that Jesus was going to come to them. Do you understand that? I mean, did, were they really expecting to see him that night? I don't know about that. They're hiding. They're not looking to be found. Right? They should have known that Jesus would come to them. Because Jesus, just by being Jesus, would come to settle their hearts. Jesus would come to get them on the right path. To get them moving. Amen? They should have known. We should have known. I mean, how long did it take for us to come to love Jesus? For, for all of us have different time lengths. All of us have different stories in that regard. But, you know, you should have known. I should have known. They should have known. See, that's who our Jesus is. He's the coming one. So, of course, he's going to come to talk to them. When? We don't know. That's why you're there. Amen? That's why you're here today. Because Jesus has promised to speak to us. Amen? What is He going to speak to us? How is He going to speak to us? What, what part of all of this is really going to hit us and, and strike us and, and uh, you know, draw us into a, a deeper and a closer walk with Him? I couldn't tell you. I mean, if I, I could tell you, I could go ahead and email something to each and every one of you. And then, you know, do you, you know... But that's not what the church is. The church is a people that loves Jesus so much, we come together and we love Jesus. And we hear Him. We hear from Him. And we're led by Him to, to stay on that path. Praise God. That's who our Jesus is. He's the coming one. Amen? They should have known He was going to come. If you're there at Luke 24, I want to show you this right from the Scriptures. Look at verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Didn't walk through the door. Didn't climb in a window. He just poofed. You know? You know, beam me up, Scotty. You know? Right out of Emmaus and into that room. And he says, peace be unto you. Did you ever go through the scriptures and find the places where Jesus talks about peace? There's quite a few of them. And he's talking about a right relationship with God. Amen? He's not just talking about the absence of conflict or war or any of, the, any of these other things. Watch this. But they were terrified. They were terrified. Shuddered. Dreading. The opposite of courage and the opposite of boldness. They were scared stiff. They were terrified when he shows up. I think they were terrified before he showed up to tell you the truth. The Bible actually says that they were hiding. And supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, watch this, he says unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? In other words, fellas, and there are some women there too, I'm sure, uh, because there were others besides the disciples. So, you know, people, people, you should have known. Why, why are you troubled? You should have known. Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Why are you doubting like this? You should have known. I told you this is what the situation was going to be. You should have known. You should have known. Behold my hands and my feet. Look, 
It is. It's, I, it's me. It's myself. Handle me. Handle me. This is an interesting point. We didn't cover that this year. We're not covering all of the resurrection appearances. We're just trying to stay in the Gospel of Luke on these things. We're going to mention some of the others, but we're not going to be going through them verse by verse. But when Mary Magdalene sees Jesus, when she's outside the tomb, what does she do? She falls down at his feet and grabs a hold of his feet. And, um, and Jesus said, you know, don't do that. I haven't ascended up to my Father yet. Don't, don't touch me that way. Don't, don't try to hold me. Don't try to hold me back. What are you trying to do? Be an anchor? You know, hold me back? Hold me by my feet? I need to ascend up to my Father. Okay? Um, it's interesting, the concept there. In, when Mary does it, it's a handling with the sense of shaping him into what she wants him to be. And that's why Jesus said, don't touch me that way. Okay? Don't try to shape me into what you want me to be. You want me to be your Jesus. You want me to be your rabbi. You want me to go ahead and, and stay with you here. Okay? And that's why you're holding me down. That's why you're, you're, having, you're anchoring me to the, to the earth. Okay? This word for handle is a different word. Okay? Now listen carefully to what it is. It means to touch lightly. It is not a molding or a trying to shape Jesus into what you want him to be. It is not that. But rather to learn about his composition. What is this Jesus made of anyway? Well, they should have known. How many times did he make it clear what he's made of? How many times did he make it clear that he was going to suffer and die and rise again? Amen? They should have known. And we should have known too. Long time ago we should have known. I think we need to recognize that. We need to thank God for, you know, he kept at it and kept at it and kept at it and finally brought us into his presence, praise God. But he tried too long before that. Lots of things throughout your childhood God was trying to show you himself. We should have known. We should have known. He says, go ahead and handle me. See, with Mary, he says, don't touch me that way. Don't handle me that way. Don't try to shape me into what you want me to be. Now he actually tells them to handle him, but it's to touch, it's to touch lightly. It's not to shape him. It's not to mold him. It's rather to learn the, his composition. What is this Jesus made of? That's a whole nother story. You hear me? That's a whole other story. They are told to do that. Mary was told not to. But it was a different kind of touching. A different kind of handling. Praise God. There's more that could be said there. But I think for our purposes that will be enough. And when he had, spoke, had thus spoken. He showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy. You know you've heard people say it's too good to be true. Right? Right? It's too good to be true. This is too good to be true. He really is alive. And he's here to help us. You know, that's a hard one to get your arms around. It's a hard one to get your mind around. Amen? They believe not for joy. Okay? Great joy, by the way, is what joy means in the Greek. Exaltation, praise God. And, and, and they wondered too. They wondered. And he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? Now, they don't know it yet. But this is the very thing he's going to ask them at the lake. Do you have any meat? And he was not asking those disciples who had decided to go back to fishing. We don't know what's going on with this Jesus. He shows up, he leaves, he shows up, he leaves. We don't know, we, we've got to go back to fishing. So we're going back to fishing. Peter said, I go a fishing. That's what he said. So he goes, and the, several of them go, seven of them I believe it is, go out into the lake and they fish all night and they catch nothing. All of a sudden they see somebody standing on the shore. And he yells out to them, Have ye any meat? And I've heard preachers say, 
on the radio and TV and all that. I hear preachers say that, that they're asking, have you caught anything yet? You know, because that's one of the rules. If you're at a lake and you see somebody fishing, you've got to ask them, how you doing? It's a rule. You'll get kicked out of the lake if you don't. You hear me? You, you've got, it's a rule, people. It's the law. You've got to ask them how you're doing. Catch anything? You know, that's what they're saying Jesus said. He's not saying that. He asked them sp specifically, you know, do you have any meat? Or do you just have formula? You know, like a baby needs to go from formula, needs to go from even breast milk and so forth, and, and work up to, you know, well, you've got to mush it all up first and everything. And then before you know it, they're, they're into some solid food, into some meat. Have you any meat? In fact, he starts his question with, Children, have you any meat? You know what the word children means in the Greek? It means babies. Hey, you babies out there, don't you have any meat? Or is it just pablum? Is it just mush? That's what he's asking them. He's getting after them, people. I mean, let's, let's understand this for what it is. He's getting after them. They weren't supposed to go back to fishing. They were supposed to stay in Jerusalem. So he gets after them. He doesn't throw them away. I'm not saying that. But he, he is dealing with them. He did the same thing on the two on the road to Emmaus. Did the same thing. Told him point blank, you guys are foolish. You guys are slow of heart to believe. You should have known better than this. And Jesus is saying that as well, even at the lake. But so before that ever happens, he asks the same questions. Do you have any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. Alright? A broiled fish. I've said this before, that the word fish is the Greek word ichthus. Ichthus. And each one of those letters is the first letter of another word. And the phrase is this. Ichthus. Taking the first letter. It's like an acronym. Okay? The, the, the first letters form uh, several words. Put it that way. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. The first letter of those words in the Greek, take the first letter, put them together in a word, and you get the word ichthus. Okay? And that is why, that is why, the fish had become a symbol or does come become a symbol for Christianity. I've told you before when the Christians were roaming the streets trying to get to the meeting place, secret meeting place for Christians on Sunday morning, they would take a piece of charcoal and make the symbol of the fish on their hand. You know, just a simple fish on their hand. And then they make their way and then they knock on the door and they open the door and they show them the fish. It's like a password. It's like a passport. You know, to get them in. Fish. So Jesus asked them, do they have any meat? And they said, yes, we have broiled fish and a, a chunk of honeycomb. Okay, chunk of honeycomb. This is interesting. The word honeycomb in the Greek is two words. And the first one is Melissa. <laughs> it's where the name Melissa comes from. Okay, and it means of a bee. Literally from the Greek. Of a bee. Well, what's of a bee? Honey. Right? Melissa. Alright? And then the, the other part of that word is keros. Keros. And it's not, no, it's not kerosene. I know, I, we probably all maybe thought that it was going to end up being kerosene or something like that. No, it wasn't. It's, it means wax. Bees wax. Honeycomb. Right? See that? And, and honey, by the way, is often mentioned in the scriptures. It's very powerful. You know, today you go into GNC and so forth, and you can find many products that have honey in them in one form or another. 
And, and we all know that, you know, a lot of people like the taste of honey. Some people don't. But, you know, but honey is got a lot of good things in it. Well, it's awfully sweet and so forth. And, and maybe you don't use too much of it at a time. But, you know, but honey is known through the scriptures as being something um, uh, nour- very nourishing. Okay, so he gives him a piece of fish and a piece of honeycomb. And he took it and he he did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you. In other words, people, I already told you this stuff. This is not the first time you're hearing it. Well, it's not the first time I've said it. It might be the first time you're hearing it, but it's not the first time I said it. Okay, he says, these are the words which I spake unto you. While I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Now, isn't that the exact same thing he told the two on the road to Emmaus? Isn't that exactly what the Bible says about that event? Amen? That, that it's from, it goes back to Moses, it goes to the prophets, it goes to Psalms, and everything is pointing to Jesus. And he opened their understanding, okay? Something that was closed before, he opened their understanding. The opposite, by the way, of opening is shutting the eyes, folding up a scroll, shutting fast with the idea of hindering entrance through closing. Close it up, can't see it, can't read it, it's, it's covered. Okay? It's covered and hidden. That's the opposite of what Jesus was doing for them today. He was opening up their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. Amen? They should have known. They should have known. He said it all before. He even says he said it all before. They should have known. Jesus loved them so much that he came and he told them again. Amen? Again. He didn't say, you know, I about had it with you guys. You guys get lost and never want to see you again because, you know, you're not listening and you're never going to listen. And so, you know, scoot, get out of here. He doesn't do that. He comes and he gives it to them again. Praise God. He loved them so much that He came. And they should have known that. Amen? He loves us so much that He's going to come. Amen? And we should know that. Yes. Praise God. Even so, come Lord Jesus. That's what it says. And when He... When he did make this stuff clear, right here, he's explaining everything that he's talking about. I think four things come to the surface. Okay? Four things. At least four things. But I'm going to hit four things. Okay? Here they are. Number one. There's the reality of the resurrection. This thing is real. This is not just an hallucination. This is no phantom. He is real. He really did die and he really is raised again. The Jesus who died was in truth the Christ who rose again. One and the same person. Praise God. He rose again. Christianity is not founded on men's dreams of disordered minds or, or visions of fevered eyes. But on one who in, in actual historical fact faced and fought and conquered death and rose again. Amen? Rose again. Secondly, what he's sharing with these disciples stresses the necessity of the cross. It was to the cross that all the scriptures looked forward to. If you think about all of the the prophetic scriptures, vast majority of them are pointing to a cross. Things like, you know, not a bone of him was broken. All these different, there's over 300 messianic prophecies from the Old Testament that point to the New Testament. And many of them, most I think, are dealing with the cross. 
Because you can't be raised from the dead unless you're dead. Amen? The cross was not forced on God. He was not caught by surprise. Oh, what am I going to do now? Uh Uh-uh. It was not an emergency measure when all else had failed and when the scheme of things had gone all wrong. He doesn't collapse in his easy chair, you know, and hold his head in his hands and, what am I going to do next? I can't figure this out. You'll never hear God say that. Anybody ever hear God say that? No, you never heard God say that. You might have heard Satan saying God said that. But you never heard God say it. Glory be to God. Amen? And it was part of the plan of God. For it is the one place on earth where in a moment's time we see His eternal love. That Jesus suffered and died to take away our sin. Praise God. Amen? Thirdly, Thirdly, there's an urgency of the task. There's an urgency going on in these verses. Out of all men, out to all men, there had to go the call to repent and then offer forgiveness at the same time. The church was not left to live forever in the upper room. We aren't supposed to live here in this building. We gather here and we need to be thankful for the place, for the time, for what He gives us while we're here and all of that. But we don't stay here. Amen? We go out from this place and we speak of Jesus and we live Jesus. See, that's what happened with that missionary. And he never knew it. In all his life, in all the years he spent in Africa, he never knew it. He did know of the one convert, there was one woman. Some people came to check out this story about only one person converted. And this woman gave them the gospel and they got saved. And then through the years, thousands of people were found to come out of this ministry. And by come out, I mean... Get saved. Be born again. Praise God. The church is not intended to live forever in the upper room. There is an upper room and we are to be here. The Bible says clearly not to forsake these things. Amen. So, you know, but we don't live here. Amen. I mean, who would you give the gospel to? I mean, other than each other. And that's all fine and good. I know I'd like to hear it all the time. You know? The old, old story. Right? After the upper room came, the worldwide mission of the church would come. They went out from that upper room and they went out and they shared Jesus. And they lived for Jesus before so many people. The days of sorrow were past and the tidings of joy must be taken to all people. And that listen, isn't that what they did? I mean, isn't that what they did? When the two realized they had been wrong, that they should have seen what they hadn't seen, that they left, they came back to Jerusalem, and what did they do? They told them everything that happened in the way. Amen? Sharing Jesus. Sharing the joy that they had. Thomas did the same thing. I told you before, he took off for India when finally everybody took off to their designated places to go and minister. And he went off to India and he, and he gave the, the gospel and a lot of people hated it and a lot of people hated him. He built a lot of churches so you know there were, you know there were a lot of people also that wanted the truth. Well, they threw a spear right in the center of his back one, one time while he was kneeling in prayer. And they came up behind him and, and killed him just like that. He took, he took the joy that he experienced when he saw Jesus as his Lord and his God. He took that out. Really, they all took it out over all the world. Praise the Lord. And the fourth, the fourth point. There are other points, I'm sure. But the four I want to deal with, there's the secret of power. 
These verses of Jesus coming into the room like this stress the secret of power. They had to wait in Jerusalem until power from on high would come upon them. That's what they had been told. And that's why Jesus got after them when they went off fishing someplace. They weren't supposed to be there. So he called them back out of there. Praise God. They had to wait in Jerusalem until power from on high would come upon them. There are occasions when the Christian may seem to be wasting time. People will tell you you're wasting time going to church. You're wasting time in Bible study. You're wasting time in in your prayer times. You could be doing stuff. I mean even things for God. You could be, oh you could be doing stuff. You're wasting your time. No, it's not what God says. Amen? Action without preparation must often fail. There is a time to wait on God and there is a time to work for God. And praise God, they're linked together. Fay Inchfawn. Now there's a name for you. (laughs) Inchfawn. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Might have something to do with uh, Native American or something, I don't know. Inch fawn, I don't know. Faye Inch fawn writes of the days when life is a uh, losing contest with a thousand little things. Here, this is a poem she wrote. Listen to this. I wrestle, oh how I wrestle, through the hours. Nay, not with principalities and powers all of the time. Not with dark spiritual foes of gods and mans all of the time. But with antagonistic pots and pans, with footmarks on the hall, the smears upon the wall. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? With doubtful ears and small unwashed hands. And with a babe's innumerable demands. And then, even in the busyness She lays aside her work to be for a moment with God and she writes this, With leisured feet and idle hands I sat, I foolish, fussy, blind as any bat, sat down to listen and to learn, and lo, my thousand tasks were done, the better so. You remember the old story, right, of of, uh, John Wesley's and Charles Wesley's mother? You know, she had a, like a dozen kids, you know, she had <laughs> busy, 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 and, you know, had, um, you know, a lot to do and constant taking care of them and so forth and had a very difficult time of finding time with the Lord. But you know what she finally did? She took her apron and she put it up over her head and created a prayer closet, if you want to call it that, and, and went ahead and prayed. And those kids soon learned you didn't bother mommy when the apron was up in the air. Amen? Because she was meeting with God. Oh, emergencies are another story, but, you know, Mommy, I want this. Mommy, I want that. You know, it wasn't long before they learned. Mommy's talking to God right now. You, you've noticed this, haven't you, when your kids were little and, and grandkids are little and so forth. A lot of times you'll be on the phone or something, right? And all of a sudden, that's when they want you the most, Right? You know, mommy, what about this? Mommy, that, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, you know, that, but it's, it's soon got to be known, you know, I'm talking to God right now. <laughs> Not on the phone, but you know what I mean. Amen? Praise God. The quiet times in which we wait on God are never wasted. Don't believe the lie. Don't listen to other people that try to draw you away from the things of God. Amen? It's, it's not wasted. For it is in these times when we lay aside life's tasks that, that we are strengthened for the very tasks that lay aside. Amen? It's, it's, it's where we become empowered for the next thing that comes along. Praise the Lord. You know, the prayer closet and, and um, you know, reading the scriptures every day and all of these things, you know, are, are God's way of... Uh, drawing us into a place where we see Him more clearly than we ever have before. Praise God. It's in these times, the quiet times, the gathering times, in which He comes and He gives Himself that we truly see and we truly know Him and thereby can be empowered by Him and His Spirit. Amen? 
So times like this, like right now, God is speaking. God is calling us. Take me more seriously than you ever have before. Right now he's saying that. You can hear, can't you? In your heart? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You know, that's kind of the, the hard thing about it. You know, we're so used to hearing voices, you know, by people being there talking that when God tries to speak something into our hearts, we often think it might be something else. The two that took off for Emmaus should have known that Jesus was going to come and sit down with them and talk with them. They'd have a chance to find out more things and know Jesus even better. Thomas should have known. My Lord and my God. He did come to know. And praise God, people come to know. We need to be praying that we come to know quickly. <laughs> Amen? Not later. You know, Thomas waited a whole week before he knew that Jesus was really alive. Wasted a whole week. Till finally, he came that following week, that weekend, and there was Jesus. Praise God. We should have known too. Amen? We should have known. And, and, and now we do. Thank God for that. Amen? Now we do. We can go in His power, even together, as one. Amen? Praise God. Father, thank You, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank You, Jesus, because we know that this is indeed Your heart. We know, dear God, that You are calling us, Lord, to recognize the fact that we should have known. We should have known. You come to us all the time and you say, yeah, well, I already told you this before. It, don't you remember I said this? I said that. Lord, it's, we should have known. We should have known. And I pray, dear God, that we will know. And tomorrow we'll know even more. And I don't mean just a, just a, uh, a knowing of facts and figures, but a knowing of Jesus. And I pray, dear God, that you'll have the glory for all of it. And we lift you up and exalt you. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Praise God.